everyone, this is Ross Raddy, and welcome to my channel, if you're new here. Um, we try to focus mainly on uh, fig trees and making videos around fig trees and cultivation of fig trees, but I grow a lot of different things. You know, I grow a lot of annual vegetables. Uh, I also grow a lot of perennial fruit trees and perennial shrubs. And that's really what I try to focus on is um, the perennial stuff. And, you know, I'm growing all kinds of things from apples to pears to stone fruits, you know, to, um, to grapes. But those things that I just mentioned, here in Pennsylvania anyway, are very difficult to grow. They require a lot more work. There's a lot more things that can harm them, you know, harm the tree itself, uh, harm the fruit, go after the fruit before I do. Uh, there's just a lot of things that make it more difficult. And if I were to start everything over from scratch, my entire backyard of fruit trees and perennials, this is what I would do differently and this is what I would plant. So this is what this video is gonna be about. Um, showing you guys the really easy stuff to plant and grow here in Pennsylvania or in a humid climate anywhere along the East Coast is relatively the same. So we have here uh, in the backyard in containers, uh, the first thing we're looking at is jujubes. And jujubes are a very reliable food source. You can see there's some here now forming on my container jujubes now. And you can put these in the ground. They're hardy to zone five. And they'll do very well in a really wide range of climates. They're, they actually are a subtropical species, but there are many varieties out there that will do very well for you in the ground here. We also have right next to that is a muscadine grape. And this is a called a erasmataz grape that I have in a container, but uh, I think there's better varieties that I can actually put in the ground that would be hardy to about negative 10 degrees. So here we get to zero. And the muscadine grape is different from the regular table grape, which I'll show you guys now. The regular European table grape is prone to lots of disease, namely black rot, mildews, all kinds of things that infect the leaves. It's actually quite incredible that my leaves look this good at this time of the year. But if you saw my fruit in my grape videos that I did, the fruit did not look that great uh, because of black rot. But um, a lot of things attack these grapes and make it very difficult to grow without proper spraying. Similar with uh, my apple trees and my stone fruits and my, my pears. Like I said, they're, they're very difficult to grow. On the other side of the yard here, I want to show you guys more things that are quite reliable here. Uh, before I do, here in my hand is actually some strawberries and this is one of the most reliable perennial food sources you can grow the nice thing about these is that you can get a june bearing type and you can get an ever bearing type this is the beginning of my ever bearing crop here of mara de bois mara de bois is the name of the strawberry and uh, it tastes like a concord grape that's no exaggeration it uh, has a very interesting plum grape like flavor uh, that's in a in a strawberry. So I'm gonna put these down and come back to them and eat them later. Show you guys more. But I just picked those. Uh, we also have in the corner, which I I kind of skipped, but you know let's go over there. Let's do it. So in the corner of the yard, in a more shadier spot, is the pawpaw, and the pawpaw is the largest fruit native to America, native to North America. And the Native Americans really grew this thing and, and loved it and ate it in quite abundance. You can see here I have two very small pawpaw trees right next to each other. These take a really long time to get some size, uh, but when they do, they become a very reliable fruit tree. That's actually quite tasty. That uh, It tastes like banana custard. So if you're not familiar with this fruit, it's becoming something that's more and more popular. There's festivals in Ohio every year on that fruit. 
We also have things down here which are um, also perennials called gooseberries. And gooseberries, in my mind, is a really, really impressive fruit that's often overlooked here in the United States. It's really widely grown um, in England. And to me, it tastes a lot like a grape. So if you like grapes, you're gonna like this fruit. The nice part about the gooseberry is that it fruits uh, before European grapes. So we got the gooseberry first, then you have the European grape second, and then you'll have the muscadine that I have over here. And we're gonna plant two more muscadine grapes, two new varieties right in here. Um, and they'll be completely disease-free, problem-free, very easy to grow. Same thing with the gooseberry, very, very easy to grow. We also have uh, down here a new thing that is becoming quite popular uh, very recently. You know, lots of universities have been breeding this. Um, you know, lots of different organizations have really been breeding these plants. They're called honeyberries or hascat berries. And in my mind, this is a very, very interesting fruit. I mean, it, it's going to be something really big that I think a lot of people are going to be wowed by. And the plants don't really grow all that much when it gets quite warm out. But you can see there is some growth being put out and they get to a pretty decent size. Just like the gooseberry, uh, they get to about four feet, four to six feet wide to four to six feet tall. And uh, that's pretty reliable. Every year you're gonna get fruit. And it's actually quite tasty. I'm really liking the fruit. The second thing here we have is a kiwi vine. Bet you didn't know you can grow kiwi in Pennsylvania. But we have a kiwi vine that I just put in the ground called uh, Anna. And Anna is a female kiwi vine. You need to have a male to go along with it. But it's a hardy kiwi. Unlike the tropical kiwi that has fuzz on the skin, these guys are like grapes. They're like kiwi grapes. You just pop them in your mouth, and that's how they're marketed in the stores nowadays. You can find them usually at Whole Foods in September. But here is the male kiwi vine that I have. Just training this up in the back corner of this tree. Eventually it will attach itself to the tree and uh, that will be the trellis for the kiwi vine. We also have something down here called a josta berry, which is a combination between a gooseberry, guys, and a black currant. It's getting the flavor of the black currant in a more edible form. Uh, of the gooseberry. So the black currant is really not all that great to eat raw, but this Josta berry takes on the the form of more of a gooseberry that has the black currant flavor and it's a really nice combination. So again, a really nice early season choice for a grape. And the black currants or the red currants are also pretty decent. Um, they're a bit lower on my scale here. But the, this is a red currant, and these guys put out pretty decent amounts of fruit. Again, they're gonna get to about four feet, four to six feet wide and four to six feet tall. And the black currant makes exceptional jam, exceptional um, wine. Really takes on a different form when you cook it. We're gonna go to the other part of the yard now, guys. Um, now, I did mention at the beginning of the video, if you're new here, that I love to talk about figs. Well, figs are actually one of the more reliable fruits that I grow. Um, almost nothing bothers them. Really only the critters, uh, like birds and squirrels, will bother just about every fruit. Um, but my figs being on the patio and being so close to the house, the birds and the squirrels don't really come over here. And um, they really put on a lot of fruit that's extremely tasty. This is my number one here for this area that I will always grow. You can even grow some of them in the ground, which I have about 10 trees, 10 fig trees in the ground that uh, in a few years can and will fruit, uh, fruit reliably here in zone seven. Now, something else that will fruit very reliably here. Oh, you know what, let me show you guys my in-ground trees. So this is one of my in-ground figs. 
and this has only been here since the fall of last year and it's got about uh, about six or seven figs on it and it's putting on some nice growth now and mixed in this bed is also more figs you can see one right there and another one right there I love to add in the rocks to give them a little bit more heat during the day and the nighttime and then the rest of this is my June bearing strawberries these are the guys that bear at the end of May into uh, into July and they produce a huge amount of strawberries for me that I can either make in a jam or eat fresh and they are incredible this is called early glow this variety here we also have something in here which I've talked about at pretty decent length this is called the the alpine strawberry and you can see these little little strawberries quite unusual right look at these little guys but guess what these strawberries pack a punch they're incredible the most intense one of the most intense fruits I grow intensely flavored it kind of tastes so intense that you almost think it's like a candy like some really intense candy let's go over to some more perennials guys on the other side of the yard and show you the rest of what I consider quite reliable here so along the house we actually have some persimmon in containers believe it or not yes you can grow persimmon in zone 7 you can grow persimmons American persimmons actually as far low as zone 5 and that's exactly what this is here um, I have it in a container because I love this fruit so much that uh, I want to plant more in the ground but I don't necessarily have the room for it so I'm making up for it by putting them in containers and uh, they do really well in containers and I really prefer the Asian types over the American types for flavor uh, which is exactly what I've done down here I've, I've grafted this year three different Asian persimmons we have uh, Tam Cam Seijo and Great Wall we have a uh, celebrity persimmon here as well as a Wang Yang persimmon which is kind of growing sideways now because of the rain I don't have a stake that large um, the other nice things back in here, guys, um, is the blackberry and the raspberry. They are incredible. And all their, their relatives, they have many hybrids. You know, there's uh, tayberries and uh, thimbleberries, all kinds of interesting little berries, guys, that do exceptionally well here and along most of the East Coast and in humid climates. You don't have to worry about any of these plants I've just mentioned. You know, there's nothing that bothers them other than critters you know you may get some fruit flies if you don't pick up the fruit off the ground but here's a nice little cluster of blackberries that I'm just protecting with this organza bag and we'll take one of these guys off and take a bite really good I mean this is quite big too you know, some of these get really nice size to them. Unlike um, some of them in the store, maybe a bit smaller. Uh, these get really nice size. And guess what? They're thornless. How many of you guys know of a thornless blackberry? We also have over here raspberries, and I come out here every day. Just about every day of the year. I would say about 70% of my growing season, I'm out here eating raspberries. It's actually pretty stupid. It's really insane to think that someone would actually buy raspberries in the store. <laughs> I did it for most of my life. It's really so easy to grow. It's not even funny. Uh, this is only two plants, and they're giving me quite a bit of strawberries. I mean, that's enough for one person to come out here every day and eat more strawberries than they can eat. 
and I really do. I come out here every day for about 70, 60 to 70 percent of the season and eat homegrown raspberries that guess what tastes a lot better than the store too don't get much better than this guys I'm telling you and one other thing that's really reliable here is the mulberry the mulberry guys is done fruiting fruits um, in like June through July along with my June bearing strawberries and the problem with this tree is that it just is too big. So what we're gonna end up doing is actually cutting it back. And I'm gonna graft a variety on here that's actually quite dwarfed. It's called uh, Girardi Dwarfed Mulberry. And uh, these guys look, if you don't, you're don't, you not familiar with the mulberry, it, they look like blackberries. Um, the fruit itself looks like a blackberry, but smaller and in my mind, tastier. You can see up here, the leaves, uh, the leaves here are very ornamental. I mean, they're heart-shaped leaves. It's a very ornamental tree. People usually have them in ornamental settings, but they make such a mess that if you don't eat the fruit, people have been dissuaded from growing them. And you can grow these really as low as zone five, most of them. This right here is an Illinois Everbearing, and look how just beautiful that a tree is. It's so beautiful. It's a shame I'm gonna have to cut it back. Right next to it is my one of my mature persimmon trees. It's really getting some nice size because uh, I've <laughs> really something quite unfortunate happened to this tree. I would have preferred to have fruit this year. But uh, a windstorm came in and, and literally knocked this tree over on its side. It was on the ground. The trunk of the tree was on the ground. And set the tree back, I guess. It just didn't want to fruit. But you know what? It doesn't matter because it's growing so vigorously that next year I'm going to have more persimmons that I know what to do with. This is a hybrid persimmon called uh, Rosianca. And Rosianca is because it's a hybrid it takes on the flavor of an asian persimmon which i said i like more than the american types but it has the hardiness of the american so this persimmon can be grown as low as zone five a really really nice addition um, it's also quite ornamental right you get these nice dark green leaves you get an interesting structure to the tree that naturally happens. And in the wintertime, these trees will be holding orange globes of fruit that nobody knows what they are. And they're just sitting there looking really, really cool. So, very beautiful trees and reliable. Uh, I guess the last thing, which I didn't show you guys, is out in the front of the house here. But that is where my blueberries are, my everbearing Mara de Bois strawberries. Again, both of those are quite reliable here. With the blueberry, you just have to give it a little bit of acidic soil. If you plant them in peat moss, it's, that's it. Make sure they're well mulched, well watered, because they, they can dry out quite easily. But other than that, that's it guys, so if I were to do all this all over again, those are the things that I would plant the most. And as a little bit of a bonus here, we have all kinds of stone fruits in the ground. This is um, two cherry trees, but they're on a, a, a semi-dwarf rootstock, so they're only gonna get about to be eight feet, 18 feet tall if left on prune, right? They're not very vigorous. Um, I have apple trees that you didn't get to see in the front by my persimmon. We also have dwarfed apple trees right here. And these are on a 